And so it's just fun to either open the office door and see all the animals and just say, I love you, cow. I love you, cow. I love you, pig. It just, I don't know why. I, I think I've probably done it my whole life. But but it, it shows that, you know, you, you have relationships with these animals and, you know, they're they're not expendable and they're amazing. When you say, I love you, cow, and I love you, pig, it's it's part of that. And I think they know it. Hey, I'm Dr. Doug. I'm a chiropractor for both animals and humans. My life's passion is volunteering at farms and helping rescue animals in need. Join me as we connect with people who have dedicated their lives to helping animals. Together we'll discover how helping animals live better lives will teach us to be better humans. Welcome to the Animal Cracker Podcast. Today we're thrilled to host Kathy Stevens, founder of Catskills Animal Sanctuary. With over 22 years of dedication, Kathy has been a beacon of hope for both animals and people. Kathy's passion shines through in everything she does, from teaching about the link between animal agriculture and climate change, to sneaking an iced tea to Russell, the potbelly pig. Her enthusiastic catchphrase that she shouts, I love you, cow, embodies the heart of the sanctuary. A celebrated author and speaker, Kathy has received prestigious awards like the 2020 Carol Noon Award and was named Best Environmental Advocate in 2021. Join us as we explore Kathy's insights on our relationship with farmed animals and its impact on our world. Welcome, Kathy Stevens. Dr. How did you Doug, like not <laughs> How'd you Abby. How'd you like that intro? It was good. You pulled that from a few different places. Yeah, I do my research. I'm like ready for you. Yeah, I can tell. You know, I want to just plug you right away because maybe people are only watching for a few seconds and they're out of here. Shh, hold up your book because you have you have you have two books, right? We have three books. Oh, so, okay. so I personally have two books. The first one I couldn't grab the second one in time, but the this is the first one. It's called Where the Blind Horse Sings. Mm -hmm. um it it was i think there's something like 13 editions of it it's on it's on uh on a kindle but you but you can get it through our website yeah no we're gonna have the link of that too so if anybody's listening or instead of watching this on the animal cracker youtube channel uh you can see it in the description box so we'll have all the links it was published almost 20 years ago now and it's a story of the early years in which we were a small sanctuary and we took and i was doing at the time i was doing the animal care direct animal care um, which i don't do so much anymore and it centers around three animals who absolutely changed my life and changed the way this sanctuary functions. One was a blind horse who's on the jacket um, and is referenced in the title. One was a once violent, violent sheep who became the, the guard sheep of every single being here. And one was a former fighting rooster who rode in my car and slept in my bed and it's just that it's the story of learning who they are when we pay a certain kind of attention and what that does to transform us as humans and, and their lives. And then the follow up to that book. Is Wait, I'm going to have to stop you because you basically just did kind of the mission statement of this podcast. So what I want this podcast to be about is I want to interview the people that make a difference in the lives of animals. but Adding on to that, I also want to know how that journey changes how we show up as humans. Yeah. And and that's exactly what you just said. And so um, stay tuned if you're watching this or listening to this, because we, we do want to hear maybe highlight those three stories, the blind horse, the sheep and the rooster, because I think that would illustrate the work we do for the welfare of animals, but also how it touches and shapes us in humanity. And that's what I really feel like I want this podcast to be about as opposed to like how many pounds of food do you feed your animals every day? Not that that's not interesting, but I don't want it to be like a statistical show of like, well, we did this amount of <laughs> feed this morning. I think that's interesting, but I want to know, get to the heart of this. And, and that's exactly what you were just describing. Good so I, I almost got goosebumps. You'll have a good you podcast know. then. Yeah, because that's that's how I want this podcast to be in general is is 
is the stories and, and how it shapes us. What's your second book? Second book is a follow-up to Where the Blind Horse Sings, and it's called Animal Camp, which I I cannot stand the title. I was vetoed by the publisher, and we got stuck with Animal Camp, but the but the subtitle is something like um, A Decade of Love, of, of Love, Hope, and Veganism at Catskill Animal Sanctuary. And so it's a continuation. Those two books together tell the story of the first 15 years of this organization. And then that was followed by our our plant-based cookbook, Compassionate Cuisine, oh, wow. which not only is a cookbook, but it also features stories of the animals at, at the beginning of every section. So it's a, and it's, it's a, it's a user-friendly book. It's done by two amazing professional chefs, but it's sort of done for people who don't have three hours to put together a nice meal. There's so much I want to talk to you about because I know there's the the politics and the the big environmental impact. But why don't you just open with one story, maybe of the three, either the blind horse, the sheep, or the rooster, and that would just warm us all up, and then we can move into some of the heavier issues as far as what you guys deal with as a sanctuary. Is that okay if we start with which th- of the three would you like to oh, tell us about? Percent. Well, since you named Buddy first, the bu- blind horse, I'll start with the blind horse, Buddy was our first blind horse. He's one of 10 that we've taken in over the years. And the woman who called me was the head of an an equine rescue. And she said, Kathy, I don't think he's, he just needs a chance. His humans did not know how to adapt when he lost his vision. And so when he came, he was scratched from barbed wire because they had him in a barbed wire paddock, irregular barbed wire paddock, cut scratches all over his head. They didn't think apparently to put his food in the same place every day. So he was thin. He he wasn't emaciated. We've taken in horses and cows who are four and five hundred that's um, that's almost that's almost like a a, a rude practical joke. It's like it, let's move it, his it, let's move his food it, every day. So he's it, really it, confused. Yeah. So he came. He was utterly terrified. It took probably an hour to walk him with baby steps, baby just just baby steps off the trailer to the barn, and he was shaking, he was shaking. I remember that. And the only way to get him to move forward was to take a a bowl of sweet feed, let him smell it and drag it forward. And he'd move an inch at a time and an inch at a time. And finally we got him to the barn, but he very quickly figured out how different life was and that we were there trying to learn from him what he needed. I never had dealt with a, a blind horse, but A, I grew up on a horse farm and B, I was a had animals all in my life, all my life. B was a teacher, and I think some of being a teacher can easily translate to working with animals. Because when you're a teacher, you're also always a student. Within a week, that animal was demanding that I ride him, and the reason he was demanding that I ride him, I had no intention of riding a thirty-year-old blind horse, but he wanted to <laughs> run. He wanted to run, and I'm so, and they can't. Blind horses can't run, and so I would go out with him, and we would run as fast as I could, leading him. You know, running beside him. But I'm not a horse. I couldn't. I couldn't run. He could only trot when I was running and he wanted to gallop. It was so obvious. So I said, okay, I guess I'm riding this horse. He's the only horse we've ever ridden in, in all these years at the sanctuary. And it was only because again, he was demanding that. So how did you know he wanted to run? Because like you're, he was you're, you have him on the, you have him on the lead and he's trotting by you, which is probably as fast as you could go. As fast as I much. could go. And yeah. he was outpacing me. I had to oh, hold I him see. back. Yeah. And he and he was excited. He was alert. He was just, he was having fun and he wanted to go faster. So. And I, how, old, how, did, how old did you estimate him to be at that time? We were he told was 30? he was 30, but he was an extremely young 30. Normally, if even if you believe in that riding is okay, you wouldn't ride a 30 year old horse, but he was right. an extremely youthful 30 year old horse. And, and I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, not a heavy person. I weigh 120 pounds. So I got on this horse 
and taught him, I thought, what do, what do blind animals need to know in order to keep themselves safe? They need to know stop. They need to know up. They need to know down. They need to know the word I used was choppy, which, which signaled to him, your terrain's about to change. Your terrain's about to change. So lift your legs high so you don't trip. And then water, I didn't want him to suddenly be walking into water and be surprised. So it took very, very, very little time for him to understand what those words meant. And we would go out and the length of our rides would get longer and longer. And we would go, we, we had a route that we would take down a, down a wooded path, down a hill, through a creek, up a steep bank, down another path and then into a massive field and one day buddy started to trot just and I said to myself okay this is the day he started to trot and then he started to canter and then he was galloping in this like 50 acre field galloping at full tilt and he galloped for a couple minutes because you can't sprint for that long right mm-hmm but then he, he stopped. He slowed himself down. I was just allowing this. I wasn't encouraging or discouraging. I was just facilitating and keeping him from running into a tree. And, and, and so then he stopped and he snorted and he went like the most joyous neigh. And I, what I felt from him was like, I'm free. I'm free. And that moment, that moment changed my life. It just it was the first moment in this 24 year history, 23 year, four year history, when I realized, okay, if you really pay attention, you can help limited animals have a more fuller life than you ever had imagined you could provide for them. That, Cause that certainly wasn't the plan. And so that was Buddy. And Buddy was amazing and Buddy was hilarious and Buddy was impatient and Buddy wanted to be ridden twice a day so he could, but he couldn't get ridden that often. So, and he, you know, he died, he lived here till he was 36 or seven. Just, wow. And yeah. you had this great relationship with him the whole time? Unbelievable relationship. Did you, did you ride him often or? Or just a little at the, at the oh, beginning. Oh no, a couple times a week. But then, but then it a couple times a week, really, just for the first year, and really, then it did get too old. His arthritis yeah. was developing, and he did get too old. Where that was, that was would have been healthy for him. But I, so what I did was put a lunge line on him. If it's a just a fifty foot mm -hmm. rope, so he could at least run, not free, but he still had that desire to run. Wow. That's so cool. You know, um, I think both animals and people, you know, we, we're really here for self-expression, purpose, and some of those themes are much bigger than what a lot of us think. You know, it's not necessarily accumulating money or accolades. Uh, those are great things, but, but like living a life with purpose or living a life with self-expression is something that touches our souls and hearts at the deepest level. And to do that with an animal is, is incredible or have an animal do that for us because you also felt uh, the lessons of, of Buddy back to you, right? Like he was your teacher in many ways. Oh, in so many ways. In so yeah. many ways, yeah. This, the second uh, podcast, uh, I think it's second or third podcast we published uh, was with the Guiding Eyes uh, Seeing Eye Dog program. Yes. And this woman was amazing, but she talked about getting her uh, seeing eye dog. And she's with the she's with the company now. She's, uh, you know, she works full time with them. But she said how much it set her free to have this relationship with this dog that was her seeing eye dog. And, and in a way, you were her seeing eye human. I mean, Buddy's seeing eye human. We have been the seeing eye humans, yes, for ten for ten horses, a blind duck, a blind cow, mm -hmm. some blind sheep. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a privilege. It's a privilege yeah. and it's a gift and it makes you redefine disability. Because if if an animal if a if an animal who can't see trusts you it's and trusts their environment you're a part of that it's remarkable how quickly their fear goes away 
And it's also yeah. remarkable to watch guests who come, who's who initially, like we've had a, lots of people see the blind animal and burst into tears. And then they oh. watch Buddy rubbing his head and try, practically knocking me on the ground and going, you know, they, they lose that pity when they see how full the animal's life is. Yeah, I've, I've worked, I don't know, less than 10, but I've, I've worked as an animal chiropractor with probably close to 10 blind horses. We have two or three that I videotape that's on my Animal Cracker YouTube channel. Um, you could see how I do that. But, um, y you know, it's, it's another facet to what you're talking about is that horses specifically are prey animals and mm. their whole wiring, their, their, blueprint of their DNA and their wiring is they're a prey animal. So even though they're huge, lovely, incredible, athletic, you know, I was going to say like a specimen of, of the most incredible power and grace, they, they uh, are scared and skittish uh, if they can't perceive their environment because their, their whole survival is to be able to Sleep. see their environment. Their yeah. eyes are shaped on the side of their heads they have as close to 360 degrees of panoramic view, which saves their lives every day. If you put a horse in a stall, you're supposed to leave some type of window or view for them. Otherwise, they get really upset because they need to see, they need to look for that lion. They need to be a, uh, aware of their environment and their safety. And so then you take blind uh, sight away from a horse, and that is incredibly stressful. So then you got this horse to come to your farm, and probably didn't feel taken care of and by the people that were managing or, you know, caring for him at the old place uh, with the barbed wire cuts all over and the movement of food and not having that safety. And when, then when he bonded with you and your group, he felt finally like I can trust and be safe and she's got it for me. She's got my back. And you also have the horizon because you'll, you'll see the horizon for her, meaning you'll look out for the lions and then buddy can finally breathe and then maybe go evolve to the next step, which would also be, well, if I could trust my environment and if I could be safe, then maybe I could run. Maybe I could, you know, have my purpose and my self-expression that's in the heart and soul of, of maybe all of us. And you were able to facilitate I and it's, it's such us. an emotional uh, story for me to listen to. So I, I, Thank you for your service with, with not just Buddy, but everybody. Dr. Doug, it was an amazing, you know, that there have been so many ma amazing experiences over the years, but that was one that will I'll hold on to forever. And, and the interesting thing is that this all took place within a matter of days. He just needed somebody to pay attention. <laughs> to yeah. listen to him and because he, his, the speed of his trust was, took my breath away. You've only been here for a few days. What do you mean? You want to go out and gallop <laughs> with me on your back? Okay. <laughs> okay. I guess that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's such a great story. Let, let's get a, a little bit of logistics and nuts and bolts here. So you're Sanctuary, you're the founder of this 501c3 kind of nonprofit, right? And it's yep. in Saugerties, New York still? Yeah. Okay. I met you guys. You know, it's funny. I, You guys were on my radar like two or three years ago. I might have emailed you guys. I'm not sure. Anyway, I don't know if it ever got through. But uh, someone from your from your uh, farm, you know, reached out to me a, a couple of weeks ago about setting something up. And I was thrilled because you're not too far away. You're only about two hours from where I am in New York City. And I do go to rescue farms. That's what I do. And um, nonprofits as a volunteer. And I, I, I work with animals. I love that. And so I would love to come and work with you guys at some point. And I know we're going to make that happen. Uh, we, would we, we can't wait for that to happen. Because I, I'm a fan of chiropractic. Whenever my, whenever I do something stupid, because I still act like I'm 20, and you know when I'm like, for example, helping unload a tractor trailer load of hay, and the next day I'll just I'll feel my back a little bit, F S4 and S5. Well, L4, L5. L4, L5. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I'll go to the chi <clears throat> chiropractor and just. He does the trick. So I'm a big fan of chiropractic. We have used it with animals mm -hmm. and we've got so many ancient 
animals here. We have we have horses in their thirties and pigs, pigs, pigs that are twenty and cows that are twenty and. We have lots of animals who could use. Well, them. I know how to work on all of them. I have videos of me working with horses, dogs, pigs, chickens, cows, cats, rabbits, geese, ducks, everything. Wow. And, uh, and really making a difference. For example, I don't think you could find many videos, if any, on YouTube of anybody working with a bird like I do. So I work with ducks and chickens and geese and turkeys. I wish we had you'll, known you'll you You'll see earlier. horse chiropractic, but not... I not chicken chiropractors yeah and we've had so many ducks in particular with mobility issues and i wish we'd met yeah. earlier but we're meeting now so that's beautiful there's this one duck uh and we've made some videos with this duck it's the duck's name is mushu and it's at tamerlane Anim tamerlane animal sanctuary and mushu would walk two steps and fall on its back and walk two steps and and flip on its back and we adjusted, or I adjusted Mushu's, uh, found a, you know, um, mammals have seven bones in their necks, but like a duck has 14 bones in their neck. So I have to know all the different anatomies. And I found this little bone at the top of Mushu's neck that was out and stuck and not moving right. And I adjusted it. And then Mushu started walking normal. And uh, yeah. a year later, I saw Mushu again and Mushu needed a little tune up, but not bad. And um did another adjustment on Mushu, but Mushu pretty much has a normal life now. He can walk and get in the water and do all the things it likes to do. Um, so it's it's really uh, exciting for me to volunteer at farms like you have, where where they line up a whole list of uh, animals for me to see when I get there, and it's so much fun. And uh, so I want to do that with you guys soon. Okay, that would be awesome. I'd love to do more stories, but I also want to hear some of the work you're doing. Um, how has climate change, you know, impacted the C, C, if I say CAS, that's Catskill Animal Sanctuary for people listening, but that's, uh, or your sanctuary, how has climate change impacted? And, you know, it's, it's funny because climate change is such a macro topic, but it comes down to a micro moment. And so the macro moment of climate change is like big global things. But then, at your specific farm in this specific location, it really has changed stuff. We took in 40 sheep a year and a half ago from a neighbor who had a backyard slaughter operation, potentially illegal, don't really know. And they all had life-threatening hoof rot and to the point where they life-threatening hoof rot and severe anemia because of their parasite load and despite blood transfusions, we lost five of the 40, but the, but the rest did just fine. But it took way longer than it should have taken for us to clear up that hoof rot because we couldn't completely dry out our fields. So we're in a valley. As you'll see, mm -hmm. we're in a valley. Water comes down from the west. Water comes down from the east. We've got a bunch of underground springs that feed our pond. And with these... Like you said, glo the climate change is a very macro level concept, but you have many, many, many micro level events. We have these um, sudden violent storms that have resulted in incredible tree loss. We've lost half of our trees. And when you lose trees that are on a hill, then you lose the soil that's on there on that hill when these violent rains rains dump mm -hmm. two inches in, in an hour. And so our hills, our hill fields are becoming rock. We've lost a half of our shade trees. Right. And then you also get the runoff because the root structure or the root system helps part of the stability of that uh you know, of that terrain. So if you lose those trees, you lose the root stability, and now you're going to get, you know, it's going to change everything on that. It has changed side. everything. So the barn is flooding despite hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years that we have put in to infrastructure, curtain drains, French drains, perimeter drains, uh, huge culvert pipes, pitching the roads so that the mm. water runs into the ditch rather than into the pasture, constant work like that um, for the first 15 years of our history. Like it's not enough. And so we, we got to the point where we consulted, we consulted engineers, we consulted a flood, flood mitigation expert. We talked with a guy 
up here who's the head of the soil and water district for our county. And they all said the same thing. There's nothing more to do unless you can physically elevate this entire, like we're, we're a bowl, we're a bowl. We, yeah. and, all, and all the barns are here. Like when you first started it, was it that way or did it really escalate as the years went by? No, it's escalated. And we started noticing changes. Well, another thing that has impacted this is that so many of our hardwood trees are uh, being infl- afflicted by whether it's beetles or moss. You know, they're, they're, the ash trees are being wiped out. So you've got the double whammy of these micro events and intense winds and intense flooding that are causing trees to die, to topple over. But you've mm-hmm. also got diseases that are that are wiping out whole species of trees. So we started noticing a pretty dramatic change in, I look back through our board notes in 2017. So how many years were you there where it was at least having some semblance of balance before you said, oh no, now we're in a we're, we we clearly have an issue. We were here for 15 years. Now, because we're in a valley, we always had flooding in some of our low-lying fields in the spring. So we would trench and dry them out as best as we could, but basically wait for the summer months for them to dry out completely. But now we have two big pastures that we literally haven't used in three years. Wow. So, so, so you see a clear line of change. Oh, it's stark. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, there's i uh, I'll also put this in the link too, which is a uh, New York Times did a feature article on you guys talking about, about this situation, this crisis that your specific farm has gone through. And uh, which again is not general. The New York Times did it on your farm specifically. Uh, on our farm specifically, yeah. but I believe she did reference the fact that sanctuaries around the country are either moving, have moved or looking to move. Um, yeah. No, no, she did say that, the journalist, but she picked your farm to like to feature. Yeah. And uh, so I thought that was a really cool article. And then so what what's in your future? Are you guys looking for a new location? We're uh, actively looking. We have a team of people that we absolutely love mm-hmm. and we do not want to lose this team of people because we move three hours or 10 hours away. A, B, we've got so many old animals and we don't want them to have the stress of a long relocation. And C, a lot of our our support, a lot of our visitors, a lot of our our donors come from the city. And so we, Mm. for those three reasons, we don't want to leave this region. And so it's taking longer because our, our search radius is narrow. Yeah, and I know prices have gone up since, uh, the pandemic because so many people are deciding they can work remotely. So the area that you guys live, uh, real estate prices have gone up dramatically in the past five years. Yeah, they have. It's not going to be an easy, it's, you know, it's a big uh, nut to crack, but we have to, we've got a good team of support. We're hoping that other people will get behind this and we're, we, we will, everybody asks if we're launching a capital campaign, we, we will, but we want to find that property first. We want to know what specifically right. what we're raising money for and want to be able to tell the precise story of that new location. So that would take a specific fundraising campaign as opposed to just uh, your ongoing campaign for for what you do in general. That would be a capital raising campaign. That would be a capital raising campaign. Yeah. We'll sell these properties. Like we we never erased the property lines. We have 150 acres but that 150 acres is made up of seven different properties that are all connected. We didn't, we kept the property lines intact. So Mm -hmm. for example, this house that I'm sitting in, the homestead, our bed and breakfast sits on two acres. That's for sale as a house. The farm is for sale. The sanctuary down below is for sale as an individual farm. So So hopefully, hopefully you can move within a half an hour, 40 minute radius of, of where you are, right? Bingo. That would be the best. Yeah. Bingo. And if someone wanted to get on your website and, you know, even just, can someone do a small donation or are they allowed to, you know, just get involved and get started with helping you guys out? How, how would, how would, how would someone do that? So, uh, people can go right on the website and we have a slider and people can click and donate as little as $10 for a bale of hay. All right. So 
what's your website? And we're going to have this on the screen as well. But if someone's just listening, what is your website so they can get to your page? It's it's C A Sanctuary dot O R G. Okay. And to make it easy, it's in the description box, not only to find Kathy's books, but also, um, you know, her donation page or link to the the great work that she's been doing for over close to 24, 25 years now, right? 24 years, yeah. Yeah. which is pretty, pretty awesome. I'm really excited to hear about either the rooster or the sheep at this time. Okay. I need I need my my fix of an animal story right now. Okay. Which do you think which which do you think we should tell? You pick. Give me the like a a personality description. Like I think you said one was angry. And Rambo was came here violent and angry and dangerous. Rambo the That's sheep. the sheep. Um uh, but Polly had been trained to be a fight Polly the rooster had trained to be a fighting rooster so he was no walk in the park either. All right. I need to hear Rambo because I'm a, you know, I grew up a Sylvester Stallone fan. So I want to hear about Rambo the sheep. Okay, so there's Rambo. There you can appreciate the size of his horns. Okay. I can see him really well. Okay. Those, those so, are some big horns. Rambo arrived filled with testosterone and rage. He oh, was wow. a very dangerous animal. He and 17 others had been locked in a stall, but in a, at a notorious local hoarders, she'd been hoarding animals for decades and getting a slap on the wrist and having animals removed and then starting over the way they do. And so we took, we'd been open for like half a minute at a brand new sanctuary. And we agreed to take these 17 animals. They were locked in once one 12 by 12 stall, 17 animals. Uh, there was an 18th animal that was the decomposing mother of a little calf that was in the stall. So we took the calf, a, a massive Holstein steer who probably weighed 3,000 pounds, who was the only one not in the stall, and then 15 goats and sheep. And the woman wouldn't surrender the animals. And so we had to proceed through court to win the case. And so for a little bit of time, while that was all happening, we couldn't neuter this animal. So we had to keep him separately in the stall because the last thing you want is babies. Sanctuaries don't breed, right? We, we turn down every animals every day. It just makes no sense to breed. We, we take in babies when animals arrive with babies, but we're pregnant. So we had him in a stall and that he was furious and we would go in every time we would open the door he would back up and just come at us boom 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 so we had to take in every time we went in we had to carry in a piece of plywood to protect ourselves from being so he'd nail the plywood instead of our thighs and eventually it just got too exhausting too dangerous he was too frustrated but we couldn't put him with the sheep. So I had this idea to let him just roam free to see what would happen. And but so not, we, not among, not among the other sheep though. Not just, among it, the other sheep. The other sheep just were in, the in other a, area. a field, were secure yeah. in a field with their own barn. Rambo was our first, we named the, the group of animals, the group of free range animals we now call the underfoot family after Rambo, Rambo was the first. And we, our barn is about a hundred and I don't know, 20, 30, 40 feet long, 20, however long a 20 stall barn is and, uh, the main barn. So we put two bale, two piles of straw at each end and Rambo spent all day long roaming the property. And as soon as we, we eventually won the case, we were able to neuter him. And so that let out some of that pent up stuff. Uh, but mostly it was his freedom that allowed him to pretty quickly start to transform. And one night I went into the barn to check on the animals the way I did every night. <clears throat> I lived right behind the barn and Rambo was lying on the far bed of straw. So he was about a hundred feet from me. And I went from stall to stall to stall, checking on this horse, this cow, this group of goats because at the time when we moved here there only we only had one barn we've since built probably 30 but at the time we just had that one barn so everybody was there 
except two, two turkeys, one of whom was blind, Chuck and Thomasina. And it was November and it was raining and the staff had left them out. So there was some miscommunication, you know, so-and-so thought so, so-and-so was bringing them in. And the, for whatever reason, they were not brought in. So the human screwed up once and then the backup screwed up because I walked right past their stall and didn't notice that these two turkeys weren't in there. So they were out in the cold on a cold November night, having a pretty miserable night. I went, I checked on everybody else. I went to the end of the barn and I said, good night, animals. Rambo stood up, walked directly up to me, looked at me and went, bah. We had never heard his voice. We had never heard his voice. So I said, show me what's wrong. Cause he was telling me something was wrong. And he turned around and he walked halfway down the barn aisle and he walked into that empty turkey stall to tell me that they were still outside. And that I, I brought in the very wet turkeys, dried them off. And then I just sat with that animal and to try to process what had just happened because he knew that they were out there. He knew that they weren't supposed to be. He figured out a way to tell a human being. He obviously thought the human being would help, which meant, which said to me in a moment, he understands that what this place is. He understands that this is a place that cares for animals. And then the thing that blew me away is that he had empathy. He cared enough to come to me and say, the turkeys need help. He, he mm. had empathy for two animals of a different species. And that single moment changed a whole lot of how we operate here. And I, that's another moment that I will never forget. And in his almost 12 years with us, he took on the role that the ram does in nature. What does the ram do? The ram it protects the flock. But we were all his flock. Every right. human, every chicken, every cow. He used to come to my my bedroom window when the cows were out. Bah, bah, right. Especially bah. the especially the alpha one. And he, he was the alpha one. Oh, he was the yeah. leader. He was the oh, king of Yeah. And then from there on did he did he have a he better was... relationship with you? Oh, for the rest of his life. Well, what he understood is that when something was wrong, he could come to me and we would figure it out together. Mm -hmm. But he was, he had an uncanny, there's so many stories in this, in this book, in both books, but in the first book, there's so many stories of Rambo um, coming to get me when something was wrong or following me. There was a, there's a story I was, uh, heading out to a conference. I was, it was, it was very early in the morning and I looked and our two massive barn doors, like big, big high barn doors were on the ground and they were on the ground because we had overnight put two llamas in what at the time was an empty hay room, three llamas to keep them overnight until the llama rescue could come pick them up. Well, apparently they're strong and apparently they did not want to be in the barn overnight. So they knocked down the doors and they were at our neighbor's property, 1500 feet away. So wow. I said, what in the hell am I going to do with three not friendly llamas? I'm by myself at six o'clock in the morning. So I went to get my dog, Murphy, director of canine pursuits at Catskill Animal Sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> Because Murphy and I, Murphy knew a lot of sentences. And so Murphy, I, Murphy is your wrangler, right? Murphy was my wrangler. And so I, I would say, whenever I said, Murphy, I need your help. He knew to pay attention and he would, we would somehow figure out what was needed. And I, so I went to get Murphy because I thought, all right, well, Murphy and I together somehow are going to do better than just me. So we were running across the top of the hill, trying to get on the far side of the of the llamas to drive them back toward the barn before they wound up in Kingston. And I felt the ground moving before I heard this. When sh sheep's fastest gait is a boing, 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 boing. Like when they're terrified and running for their lives, they sprint, like they spring, right? And mm -hmm. leap. And so we turned around and here was Rambo. Why was he doing that? Because he was 
detecting from my running that something was wrong. So here he comes, the head of the flock, the whole, you know, the protector. And we got on the far side of the llamas. And as I was sort of thinking, what in the hell are we going to do? Murphy started chasing the llamas. And if one sprinted, like biting at their ankles, and if one sprinted in the wrong direction, Rambo would go, put his head down and say, you're not going anywhere. (laughs) And I watched two untrained, he's not a herding dog, and he's not, two untrained animals drive these, these llamas very quickly into a lane and drive them back to the barn. And by the time we got back, the staff had shown up and we all lived happily ever after. That's amazing. That's so. It cool. was amazing, but but it it shows that you know you, you have relationships with these animals, and you know they're they're not expendable, and they're amazing. I'm not saying they're expendable to you, but to the world, sometimes they're expendable, or or they're they're not worth it. They're not worth taking good care of. They're not you know they're they're expendable, and and your work is about making a difference in the lives of these animals, and but they're worth it. They're they're such amazing connection. Well, here, here's my belief, Dr. Doug. We, we live in a culture that reveres the dog and cat. And to some extent, some of us revere wildlife. To some extent, we honor horses. We don't, as I'm speaking in gross generalizations, we don't Mm -hmm. consider the animals who who become our, our food or our clothing. And yet, if you ask the question, no one is surprised. Like we know that our cats and our dogs are, are individual. We know that they want their lives as much as we want ours. We know for a fact that they experience every emotion we do because we see it in them. We see it. We see joy. We see worry. We see sadness. We see guilt in our dogs. Oh my God. When they get in the garbage or whatever. Right. So of course a cow and of course a chicken. And of course, a goat feels every emotion we do and wants their lives as much as we we want ours and experiences pain and suffering no differently than you and I. It's just that the industries have been so successful at compartmental, at removing them. And so we don't Mm -hmm. have the opportunity, removing them and removing, keeping behind closed doors the process of of what's required to take an animal and turn that animal into food. So the job of the sanctuary really is to help people who identify as animal lovers, which is the vast majority of us, recognize what they're contributing to when they choose to eat animals. Because nobody's doing it on purpose. Nobody's waking up and saying, I can't wait to torture animals three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Who's saying that? Nobody but we're participating in it. And so the job of the sanctuary is to help people fall in love. And when you go and you sit with a cow and that cow licks your face and tears are streaming down your face, which happens almost every weekend, it changes you. It changes people. And it mm-hmm. it's like, I one of my favorite stories of this is of this young man who ran up to me after a tour. I just happened to be pulling into the driveway in front of the barn. He saw me and he burst into tears and he ran over and he grabbed my forearms and he said, I get it now. Tell me what to do. And that's that's what you're doing. That's the work. I admire you so much and, and your your journey is is so beautiful. I wanted to close with you explaining the I love you cow. It's nothing to it's nothing really to explain. I just do love the animals and I know they they know my voice and they and I I I even though science hasn't proven this, I believe strongly that animals feel our energy. So when you drive down the driveway, you can see the whole farm. When you drive the driveways at the top of the hill, so you can see the whole sanctuary laid out in front of you. And so it's just fun to either open the office door and see all the animals and just say, I love you, cow. I love you, cow. I love you, pig. It just, I don't know why. I I think I've probably done it my whole life, but I don't know why I do it. I just do it and people find it weird or funny or... I mean, I love that. If you, if you, um, if one was to watch some of my animal chiropractic videos, and I have over a thousand of them now between uh, TikTok, Instagram, I watched YouTube. I you work on a dog. 
I always ask for consent. I don't know if you'd notice that. So I say to the dog, can I work with you today? I say to the cow, the goat, the pig, the chicken, the, the goose. I literally out loud, not think it, out loud, I say, may I work with you today? And some people make fun of me in the comments and some people appreciate it. But I'm just kind of adding on to what you said because, the first of all, I feel that they do know what I'm asking. I'm moving into their bubble, into their space, and I might even be touching a pain spot on them very shortly. And I want them to know that I'm humbling myself to, to enter their space. And I know that they don't probably speak the English language, but I think that they speak the the energetic or body language language and they can perceive my intention is my intention. I'm an evil, cruel person. That's going to beat the crap out of them today. Or am I someone that's there possibly uh, in a loving, giving spirit, you know, for people that are still maybe doubting what I'm saying, think about what you could do with your own dog. Cause a lot of people can relate everything to their dogs. So with the dog, you could say the same phrase, with a different tone. And so let's say you go, you're a good dog. Good boy, good boy, good boy. With that energy and that body language, the dog knows you're happy and gets happy and wags his tail. Yeah. But you could say, you know, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you with, with the, with like the same bubbliness. You're the worst dog ever. You're the worst dog ever. Right. With, with that enthusiasm. <laughs> and the, right? and the, the dog's tail will probably wag because it's reading your language of your energy, your tone, your voice, your body language, your body posture. And that is the language. And so all of this makes sense to me. And and uh, when you say I love you cow and I love you pig, it's it's part of that. And um and I think they know it. Or we can walk into the room of an animal. The animal right away is getting a creepy feeling or a good feeling. Their, their tingly, spidey senses from Spider-Man are activated or they're like thinking, huh, this could be okay. I think I like this person. They're it's making instant decisions. Instant. And it's, it's interesting to hear you talk because so much of what you do is exactly what you do we do the slow blink and the making yourself small and we we even make a point with fearful animals just to sit down on the ground even if it's a horse or a cow just sit down and even we've had horses who are so afraid we would just sit and turn our back yeah that's what i do and yeah. I, I I just wait and wait and wait until yeah. they realize nothing bad's happening Oh, I, I couldn't agree more about the importance yeah. of that. Yeah, we are so, we are on the same page. In closing, I think you really covered, I always try to ask the, you know, the question of how is working with animals, um, you know, changed your lives. And, and you've said it, you know, pretty much in every one of your stories, but do you have like a, a closing, you know, maybe a sentence or two of, of how, you know, just to even restate it, how has it touched your soul and, and how are you forever different? What I now know is what we say here almost every day, which is that in the ways that truly matter, we're all the same. Even though I grew up on a farm and adored animals, I don't think I understood to the extent that I know now that the differences between myself and a pig are about, it, or a fill in the blank, mm -hmm. a goose, a cow, are about as meaningful as the differences between you and I, or myself and a gay person, or myself and a person of a different ethnicity. They're differences of the most superficial order. We all want the same things. And if you know that, and you really let that in, and you contrast that knowing with what animals endure, then it can't help but make you want to work for them, do everything in your power to make their lives better. Yeah, my saying is that helping animals have a better life helps us to be better humans. Yeah. And and so it's funny that they're our best teacher for being a good a good human is an animal. Because mm -hmm. they have everything. They have compassion and unconditional love and they just want to take care of their family and their herd and you know, and all that's there for us. Sure is. So thank you so much. You're you're wonderful and I love your your mission and your energy and, and I do want to come see you soon. So maybe we'll film together. Oh, you wouldn't know, that and, be fun? Yeah, and that and would be get to, really get fun. Get to get to meet and learn the names of some of your animals and connect and ask permission to work with a few. Got a few in mind. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Doug. It's 